Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another session in anatomy and physiology. Um, during this session, we will cover the respiratory system. Uh, and without further ado, let's go ahead and just dive into it. I do apologize for the way the audio sounds today. I don't have my usual set of headphones, so um, it's going to sound kind of um, echoey-ish in a large cavernous cave-ish kind of sound here. So I do apologize for the sound quality that we'll have for this session. So your respiratory system, as you are probably very intimately aware of, consists of your nasal passages, your mouth, your, your trachea, and your lungs. And we can take those components of the respiratory system and we can break them apart into two anatomical portions of them. You have your upper respiratory, which is everything that is above your, kind of your larynx on out. And then you have your lower respiratory system, which is everything that's kind of below your larynx or down in your lungs. Um, for these places, whether it's the upper or the lower respiratory system, it's lined with simple squamous epithelial cells um, in some places. In some places, they're stratified squamous epithelial cells, but there's epithelial that's going to line these areas. And the types of things that are secreted by this epithelia are mucus. So we have this respiratory mucosa that's not just found in the lower or the upper respiratory system. It's kind of found in various degrees throughout the entire respiratory system itself. So the respiratory mucosa is thickest where it lines the conducting portion of your respiratory system. <clears throat> So when I say the conducting portion of your respiratory system, that would be the parts of your um, your respiratory system where the, the air is coming in and going out. So think nasal passages, think your mouth, think your trachea, the upper part of your trachea. Um, actually, all the way down through your trachea, you have this respiratory mucosa. The job of this respiratory mucosa is to protect the lungs and protect the rest of the respiratory structures from too much debris getting in there. So it can kind of track things um, and move things up and away from your lungs. Now, there are some diseases that can affect the respiratory mucosa, including tuberculosis and cystic fibrosis. Tuberculosis is caused by a bacteria called myobacterium tuberculosis, and cystic fibrosis is an inherited disease where individuals have to inherit two recessive alleles in order to um, have this particular disease. Most people that we see with cystic fibrosis are those of northern European descent. And the trouble with cystic fibrosis is that these people have a very thick respiratory mucosa. Um, it's so thick and it so, um, makes so much of this mucus that it actually impedes normal bodily function. It impedes normal breathing patterns and it, um, it can be lethal. Um, it's a very common um, a lethal gene in fact. Um, if it's your first pregnancy or even just your first pregnancy with a specific doctor, uh, they may decide to um, test you for cystic fibrosis to see what the likelihood is of you having a child with cystic fibrosis. Um, the reason, evolutionarily speaking, that we see people of northern descent that have cystic fibrosis um, is because the higher in altitude and the colder the air is, the more mucus you have, the better you're able to humidify and warm that air as it comes into your system. So um, it's kind of like a double-edged sword that having a nice thick mucosa can be good for you, um, especially if you live in a very cold climate, um, but it can also be very problematic for you as well. So other components of the respiratory defense system, not in, including your mucosa, as we've already talked about, you have mucus cells and mucus glands. Um, they're going to produce mucus that bathes these exposed epithelial surfaces of your mucous membranes. Um, remember, mucous membranes are going to line any places that have external openings to the outside world. So think of your nasal passages, think of your mouth, that's all respiratory, or that's our mucosa membrane. In your trachea, you have cilia, and the job of that cilia is to create what we call a mucus or a ciliary escalator, very important to remember. And what that ciliary escalator does is it moves things up and away from your lungs. So it helps to sweep debris um, away from your lungs so that it does not get into that very sterile cavity of your lungs. 
Um, you also have filtration by your nasal hairs um, and your, your nasal cavities to help remove large particles. You also have mucus that will trap large particles um, in them. And down in your lungs, you have what we call dust cells. Remember we talked about them in the lymphatic systems um, in a previous session, that these alveolar macrophages, they kind of act as your surveillance cells to protect your lungs from any types of pathogens that may get in there. Now keep in mind that it doesn't catch everything, but it does a pretty good job of catching um, a lot of pathogens that could that you are inhaling in um, and coming into your body. So another job of the basal mucosa, not only does it trap debris and trap bacteria and it kind of acts as a defense, but it also helps to humidify the inhaled air. That's especially important, as we talked about, for people that live in very cold, dry environments. If you've ever been outside on a really cold day, I'm uh, from a place called Rock Island, Illinois, which is about five hours north of here, and we have really hard, cold winters where the average is like, seven degrees Fahrenheit throughout the winter, and we start getting snow in October, like we trick-or-treat with coats on, um, and we don't see any real thawage happening until late May. So if you live in a really cold, dry place, um, having nice, thick mucus helps you warm up that air because it, it's so cold. I remember standing out at the bus stop and it being so cold that it hurts to breathe in and it actually would burn your nasal cavity, that cold air. So imagine the shock of all that cold air getting down into your lungs. So what the nasal mucosa does, it helps to warm up all of that air and it also puts moisture in it so it's not as dry and it's not as harsh when it comes into um, your lungs. When you breathe through your mouth, that actually bypasses this really important step. So you've probably been there before where you have a cold and you can't breathe through your nose, a stuffy nose, you can't really breathe through it. Um, so you have to breathe through your mouth and you notice that you have really dry mouth and your back of your throat's really dry and the air feels really dry and your lungs feel really gross and icky. Well, mouth breathing it prevents us from having going through this, um, this mucosa. So that's why it's, uh, it's very important. Um, part of it, inhaling, uh, inhaling through your nose is, is important because it allows for you to uh, warm up and humidify that air. So now moving our way down into the lungs, we have the brachial dilation and our bronchial dilation and the bronchial constriction. Remember, dilation is the expansion of a tube, and constriction is the um, restriction or the closing down of a tube. Um, bronchial dilation is the dilation of your bronchial airways. Um, you don't have conscious control over either the constriction or the or the um, dilation of your bronchial. That is a job of your autonomic nervous system. Um, reduces re resistance for bronchial dilation. Pathways are bigger. There's nothing to resist against. You're getting more air into these lungs. And then on the other hand, bronchial constriction constricts these airways. Um, and it is also under autonomic control. Your parasympathetic nervous system is actually the main ruler of that control. So kind of think of a fight or flight response. Um, histamine can also, or allergic reactions, can also cause brachial constriction. Now, a lot of times when brachial constriction takes place, it's because your body is in a crisis sort of mold. So either you're allergic to something, or there is a, an, a pollutant out in the atmosphere that you could can be toxic to your body. So what your body's trying to do is it's trying to close off your airways to keep from the toxic thing from getting inside of the body. But the drawback to that is, however, um, that you may close off your airways so much that you're not able to um, get any air exchanged. Oh, excuse me, which is a huge problem. Um, the epithelia of your lungs is simple squamous epithelium, and you will probably have a question on your exam and ask you to, you know, describe the type of cells that make up your lungs, because I think this is really important, and we've talked about this over and over again from AMP1 to AMP2. Um, you have these special types of cells, actually two special types, or, well, I should say three, um, three special types of cells, nematocytes, 
type 1 are very thin, delicate, the simple epithelial cells that are found there. They're mostly nematocyte, um, nematocytes type 1. You also have these dust cells that are part of the immune response, and they help to kind of just patrol and make sure that anything that shouldn't be in there, any pathogen, um, they can engulf those. And then you have nematocyte type 2 cells, and the job of these cells is to produce surfactant. Surfactant is an important compound that is made by your lungs in order to keep your alveolar sacs from collapsing on themselves. So a neat little experiment that you can do is if you take a plastic bag and just put a little bit of water in there and then make sure all the air is out of the plastic bag and then try to pull it apart, just a little plastic sandwich bag. It doesn't pull apart very easily. However, if you put just a drop of dish soap in there, same process, a little bit of water, drop a dish soap, and close the plastic bag, take all the air out, and then try to open it up, it's much easier to open up. The reason for that is because what a surfactant does is it reduces the surface tension of the water. So it keeps that bag from staying locked, that the surface tension of water is very high, and it keeps those um, bonds, those hydrogen bonds that are formed, um, it disrupts those hydrogen bonds, and so that we can open up that plastic bag. Same thing with your lungs. If you did not have the uh, nematocyte type 2 cells there, or to make the surfactant, the problem would occur that your alveolar sacs would collapse because there's a little tiny bit of water that's left over in these alveolar sacs. It's a molecular amount of it, but even with that, these alveolar sacs would collapse and they wouldn't be able to inflate again when more oxygen came back in. So the surfactant helps to um, make sure that those alveolar, alveolar sacs don't stay collapsed. So surfactant is an oily secretion, um, contains phospholipids and proteins, coats the alveolar surfaces and reduces the surface tension of water, that whole discussion that we just had on the previous slide. Um, you can be in respiratory distress when you don't make enough surfactant. We find this quite problematic for people that have um, collapsed lungs, and we also find it very problematic for preemies because um, making surfactant is one of the last things that happens in fetal development. So if a baby is born too early, then we risk the, the, the fact that maybe they haven't started to make enough of this surfactant and it's going to be very difficult for them to breathe and live life outside of the womb. Um, so we can give them a kind of a derivative of surfactant to help facilitate um, their lives and to help them to grow and be strong until their body makes their own surfactant. So the way that gases move, because keep in mind, you know, we're in the respiratory system, so obviously we're going to talk about the movement of gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide primarily. Um, but we have to kind of go over a little bit of some of the basic laws of physics here. So diffusion, and remember, is the movement of molecules from area of high concentration to low concentration. We're mostly concerned with the diffusion of gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide primarily. Since we want this diffusion to take place very efficiently, we don't want the distance to be very far. So we have a very short distance, and the diffusion happens quite rapidly across the membrane. Carbon dioxide and oxygen are both lipid-soluble gases, so they can just go right through the plasma membrane at those nematocytes, which are um, simple squamous epithelial cells. If we had more than one layer of those cells, that would make this process of diffusion happen a little bit longer. So the good news is simple means just one layer. We only have one layer of these cells that allows for this diffusion to take place much more rapidly and more efficiently to so have a nice, good exchange of oxygen. If we have an inflammation of the alveoli, we call that pneumonia, and that causes too much fluid to leak into the alveoli. When you have all of this excess fluid in the alveoli, we don't have very good exchange of oxygen for car or oxygen for carbon dioxide. Exhale carbon dioxide, bring in oxygen to your cells. Why we, that is the case is because um, gases have a tendency to diffuse into water or to diffuse into a fluid. And so if we have more fluid in the alveolar sacs than we would expect or would like to have than what we normally have, then the gases that we're trying to exchange are dissolving into the fluid as opposed to being going into and out of the body. So that's why it compromises the function of the respiratory membrane. The respiratory membrane consists of the capillaries on one side of the alveolar sac as well as the um, simple squamous epithelial cells.
So the blood supply to your lungs, obviously your lungs are highly vascular because we want to get all of these red blood cells to this area so that we can pick up this good oxygen that we just breathe in and drop all this carbon dioxide that is the waste product from our cells. So we want to make sure that we are getting a good, rich blood supply here. So the respiratory exchange surfaces are going to receive the blood. There are capillary beds that are surrounding each one of the alveolar sacs that are in your lungs, um, arteries from the pulmonary circuit, so, and we've talked about that in the cardiovascular system and the heart, that we have these pulmonary arteries that are carrying this deoxygenated blood, and then they will form into these capillary beds around the, um, the alveolar sacs, drop off the carbon dioxide. Remember, this, this is the one time pulmonary arteries are considered blue, because they are, arteries are blue because we had a, a deoxygenated blood. Um, as I said before, capillary networks around each alveolar sac. And then we have blood from the alveolar capillaries that pass through the pulmonary venules and veins, and then go back into the left atrium of the heart. It's freshly oxygenated, um, and then it makes its way throughout the different parts of your body. Interestingly enough, in these alveolar capillaries, at the pulmonary veins and venules, we also have the site of angiotensin converting enzyme. We've talked about angiotensin converting enzyme before in either, I think it was the circulatory system, the circulatory chapter there. And we talked about how angiotensin converting enzyme um, is responsible for converting angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, which is something that we need for aldosterone to be produced. So it's a hormone, um, it's an enzyme that's required to make sure that we have the conversion of hormones take place. If you can remember what aldosterone does, aldosterone makes sure that we retain sodium ions in order that we um, retain sodium ions so that we can also retain water. So this is a good segue here. Um, and then retaining with the water helps to increase the blood volume, which increases the blood pressure. Just a picture to show you how the respiratory system is very intimately tied to the circulatory system. Blood pressure in the pulmonary circuit is very low, and that makes sense because your lungs are right, the lateral to your heart, to the left and right side of your heart. Um, pulmonary vessels can be blocked by clots that are air bubbles, and if this happens, it's called a pulmonary embolism. And if not treated um, quickly, if not discovered quickly, a pulmonary embolism can be fatal because you're not getting an adequate oxygen supply, um, or you're not getting an adequate exchange of gases that's happening in your pulmonary circuit. So now we're going to talk, we talked a little bit about the anatomy. We're going to, not going to spend so much time on the anatomy. You've probably noticed that as a trend in our classes that we have here, that we talk a little bit about anatomy, and then most of the anatomy we do in lab. Um, same process for this chapter. We're going to spend most of the time talking about the physiology of how respiration takes place. So uh, how respiration takes place, and what are some of the chemical and or um, um, and biochemical players uh, that are involved in this whole concept of respiration. So first steps first, what is respiration? Respiration is an integrated process that revolves an inhalation and an exhalation. Um, that inhalation and exhalation process um, is what we consider mostly external respiration. So when we think of the respiratory system, primarily that's what we're thinking about, that we inhale and we exhale and it's an exchange of gas. It's very, very simple, elementary, way of kind of um, categorizing respiration. The other type of respiration that we have that is equally as important is internal respiration. Internal respiration can be thought of as the exchange of gases that's happening on a cellular level. This is a result of cellular respiration. It's probably what you've called it in other classes. So at this point, the oxygen that the red blood cells were carrying to the different tissues of the body, that oxygen can then diffuse across the plasma membrane into those interstitial tissues, be dropped off to those cells so that they can use that oxygen to make energy, and then carbon dioxide, which is the waste product of cellular respiration, can be picked up by those red blood cells and then make their way back to the lungs and exhaled out of the body. That whole chemical process on the NAS we will talk about at length in this chapter. But I do want you to understand that this whole, these two integrated processes of external and internal respiration, they're really not all that different, except for one happens on uh, a level where we're exchanging gases with the environment, breathe in, breathe out, and the other one is exchanging gases within individual cells. Red blood cells drop off oxygen, pick up CO2. 
but if we don't have the CO2 that's picked up by the red blood cells, and we don't have this external respiration, and we don't have oxygen that's breathed in by external respiration and carried by the red blood cells, we don't have this internal respiration. So they are very much integrated, and one could not exist without the other. So there are three processes that are involved in external respiration. You have breathing, which we call pulmonary ventilation, gas diffusion, which happens across the membranes and the capillaries, the respiratory membrane and the capillaries that we talked about, those alveolar sacs, um, and then the transport of oxygen and carbon dioxide between the alveolar capillaries, out of the alveolar cap, out of the alveolar sac, into the red blood cells, through the capillaries, and between the capillary beds, out of the red blood cell, into the surrounding interstitial tissues. So just a pretty picture of external respiration, and I feel like I've done a lot of talking here, so I'm just going to give you guys just a couple of seconds, um, a couple, maybe a minute or so, to kind of go over this and, and sort of let all of this digest. It's really just a pictorial representation of everything that we've talked about in the previous two to three slides um, between external and internal respiration and what it all entails. All right, so pulmonary ventilation, or that actual breathing, is the physical movement of air in and out of your respiratory tract. This is what provides all alveolar ventilation. So right now, eh, that's not really all that earth shattering or groundbreaking. Pulmonary ventilation, aka breathing. Now, as we go into more of the physiology of how breathing takes place or pulmonary ventilation takes place and the physics behind this, there are a couple of gas laws. There are three, in fact, gas laws that I need you all to, we're going to go over and talk about, but I need you to really understand these gas laws. Because without an understanding of these gas laws, it's going to be a little bit difficult to really fully grasp this concept of pulmonary ventilation. What is this? Um, actually mean and how does this process take place and occur. So the very first gas law that we're going to cover is Boyle's Law. Boyle's Law we've actually talked about a little bit. If you'll remember back in the circulatory system, we talked about the respiratory pump and I said that Boyle's Law says that pressure and volume are inversely related to one another. Boom, here it is again. So what Boyle's Law teaches us and what we're looking at here is that it's showing us the relationship between pressure and the volume of a gas. So where the volume increases, the pressure is going to decrease. And conversely, where the pressure increases, the volume is going to decrease. Now that directly relates to inhalations, increase of volume, decrease in pressure, and exhalation. And that's going to be a, a decrease in volume, increase in pressure on there. So in a contained gas, external forces move molecules closer together. So when you have a limited space, the force is going to push those molecules closer together. Um, movement of gas molecules exerts pressure on the container. So those molecules are going to push back at the container. So that's why volume of the gas and pressure are intimately related to one another and why we have this inverse relationship. As one goes up, the other goes down. So air likes to flow from an area of high concentration to low concentration. What else do we have that likes to flow from an area from a high concentration to low concentration? Absolutely right. Diffusion, water, solutes. They like to move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Air flows the exact same way. So a respiratory cycle consists of Sorry, I'm trying to do two things at my time. Um, a respiratory cycle consists of inhalation, which is an active process, and exhalation, which is a passive process. So inhalation requires more energy or muscles to be used, especially those intercostal muscles to be used, than exhalation does, where it's more of a passive sort of process. And if you think about it, actively, um, when you breathe in, take a deep breath in, it's much more work to take a deep breath in than it is to release a deep breath, isn't it? So that's just a really good picture to show you how inspiration is more active and expiration is more passive. So pulmonary ventilation and inhalation exhalation is going to cause changes in volume, which are going to cause changes in pressure as well. 
the volume of your thoracic cavity where your lung paying out um, is going to change with expansion or contraction of the diaphragm of the rib cage. Remember, the diaphragm is that, that separates your thoracic cavity from your abdominal cavity there. So what we're looking at here now is that this is our diaphragm. Here we have our, our cardiac notch, which because, and why is the cardiac notch on the left side? Why do you think that's the case? And it's only on the left side. Absolutely right. It's on the left side and only on the left side because we have a larger left side of your heart. Your left ventricle is much more muscular, so as a result, um, it's going to take up more space in your thoracic cavity specifically over on the left side in reference to your left lung. So you ever want to figure out where your left lung is or what your left lung looks like on a cadaver or um, on any dissection, then you want to look for the area that's got the cardiac notch popped out of it. So it's always going to be the, the left side. So at this point here, we have no air moving. So the pressure on the outside of the body is equal to the pressure on the inside of the body. Notice the shape of this diaphragm at this point. It's nice and relaxed and a nice little dome shape. So no air is moving. Pressure outside is equal to pressure inside. Now that can change if the pressure inside falls so air can flow in. So if the pressure on the inside of your thoracic cavity is low, then that makes room for the volume to be Higher. Remember, pressure and volume inversely related to one another. As one goes up, the other goes down. Since pressure is down, then volume can be large. A couple of things to notice here. A, that diaphragm is no longer in that nice, relaxed dome shape. It's actually been forced down. It's creating more space in this dotted line in the back. I think it's supposed to represent that. Um, it creates more space for your lungs to increase the capacity of oxygen that they can carry. So it increases the volume of oxygen or volume of gases, I should more appropriately say, um, that can be held in your lungs. So we now have a high volume here. So the pressure, and remember, air likes to go from, or gas to go from area of high concentration to low concentration. So at this point, um, the, or pressures, I should say, um, high pressures to low pressure. So at this point, the pressure on the outside is greater than the pressure on the inside. Inside pressure is low, so the volume is going to be much higher, and this is going to allow for air to flow in. So as we elevate the rib cage, contract the diaphragm so it pushes down into the abdominal cavity and away from the thoracic cavity, um, it increases the size of the thoracic cavity, which will increase the, the capacity or the volume that can be held in here. Pressure within that thoracic cavity has, is decreased and air flows into the lungs. Now, before I move on to the next slide, I want you to kind of think in your mind, what do you believe will happen with an exhalation? What are some changes that you'd expect to see with an exhalation? So I'm going to give you guys a second to kind of think about this. If this is about what you said, you're absolutely right. So let's look at some changes that are taking place here. So now, notice where our diaphragm is done. It is now relaxed, and it's back in its dome-shaped kind of position. The volume of the lungs is not as high. We, this dotted line here is not as full. The capacity of the lungs isn't fully been realized there. Um, the pressure is greater. So now the pressure on the outside um, it's less than the pressure on the inside, so since there's greater pressure on the inside, what do we know about that volume of gases? Phew, it goes down, high pressure, low volume, boils law, they're inversely related to one another. So which way is air going to move? Air is going to flow out of the body. So when the rib cage returns to its original position and the diaphragm relaxes back into its dome position at the position of the thoracic cavity, the volume of the thoracic cavity is going to decrease. Therefore, the pressure within that cavity is also going to rise because volume and pressure and burst are related to one another, and this pushes air outside of your lungs. Beautiful thing, isn't it? Beautiful, beautiful thing. So now that you have a better understanding of pulmonary ventilation, exactly how this breathing thing takes place, or, you know, a picture of how this breathing thing takes place, let's talk about the uh, idea of compliance. 
So compliance is an indication of expandability. Keep in mind that there are things that are going to restrict how compliant your loans are going to be. And some of those are genetically um, predetermined and they're not underneath your control. Others you can actually work at by doing different things like sitting up properly and making sure that your rib cage is not collapsed over into your abdominal cavity and that you're able to um, fully expand your lungs as they need to be expanded. Low compliance. So if you don't have a whole lot of expandability, requires a greater force, and that usually translates into labored sorts of breathing. High compliance requires less force, so less labored breathing. As I said before, there are factors that affect compliance, and some of those are genetic. Um, the connective tissue structures around the lungs themselves. That's something that um, for you may just come here with even more or less connective tissue. Some people can expand their lungs more than others can expand their lungs. There's a lady that does this deep sea diving business, and I think she can hold her breath for like five. Very, 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 very high compliance. The connective tissue structure around her lungs, and they actually, um, it was one of those science shows I think I was watching, um, like science G whiz shows. Um, and they, they did a study on her, and they noticed that she had fewer connective tissues um, around her lungs, and she was able to expand them much greater than the average or the normal person. They called her mermaid lady or something like that. I think you might be able to, like, YouTube her or something. Um, but she was able to... Um, she was able to uh, expand her lungs greater than most people, so she could hold more air, so she could hold her breath for a much longer period of time. Um, the level of surfactant that's produced, so how much surfactant you have that keeps your, your cells from um, those alveolar sacs from collapsing in on top of one another. If you have a greater deal or higher level of surfactant, you're able to expand those alveolar sacs much in, at a much faster rate if you have a higher compliance. And then the mobility of the thoracic cage. Now, that is something that you can control. That's not just a genetic thing. Um, things like yoga, stretching, making sure you're not so stiff, staying physically fit, proper posture, all of those things can um, increase your compliance. So now more discussion on pressure. Interpulmonary pressure, also called interalveolar pressure, and interalveolar pressure I think helps you to understand exactly what we're talking about. And we're talking about this pressure within the alveolar sac, within the lungs itself, um, is relative to atmospheric pressure. Now, remember the same way we did for blood pressure, we said that there's a lot of ways that you can measure pressure in atmospheric units and tors and millimeters of mercury. We're going to primarily measure it in millimeters of mercury. So. Um, when atmospheric pressure is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. When you have relaxed breathing, the difference between atmospheric pressure and interpulmonary pressure is fairly small. So it's about negative millimeters of mercury on inhalation, and that kind of makes sense that this is a negative number. And when we say negative, we're going minus, 1 minus 760 millimeters of mercury. So that amount... The fact that it's less than uh, 760 millimeters of mercury makes sense on inhalation because the volume has increased. Higher volume, inhalation, bringing gases in, pressure goes down, Boyle's law. So that number, the fact that it's 759 millimeters of mercury makes sense for us. And then the same with exhalation. When you exhale out, we have a um, higher pressure. So, or I'm sorry, we have uh, when we exhale out of the lung, that volume is going to be lower, and then that pressure is going to be higher. So, of course, it would be 761 in reference to normal atmospheric pressure or 760 millimeters of mercury. So this number here, if I were to write it down, um, interpulmonary pressure when you inhale is 759, that's 1 minus 760, and 761 on an exhalation. So there are actual numbers if you want it, um, if that made you helps you understand this process better. Interpleural pressure is the pressure in between the parietal and the pleural cavity of your lungs. Notice these numbers are slightly different. It averages um, negative about negative four millimeters of mercury, which is much higher than like a negative one. Um, and a maximum of it is about 
about negative 18 millimeters of mercury. So that remember that's 18, you know, 760 subtracted from 18. Um, we like to keep, and I'm going to star this because I think this is very important. We like to keep our interfloral pressure below atmospheric pressure throughout the respiratory cycle because the elastic fibers to remain stretched even after a full exhalation. Um, because we can have this kind of um, stretching after the full exhalation and where atmospheric pressure, whether it's on an inhalation or an exhalation for the full respiratory cycle, it's going to be lower nickel creates the respiratory pump. And remember, the respiratory pump is vital in making sure that blood can get from your veins where the pressure is already lower in your vein just because of physics um, back to your heart, especially if it has to overcome gravity. Respiratory rates and volumes. Um, respiratory system adapts to changing oxygen demands, and that you probably understand if you've ever gone to Denver um, and hiked in Denver, and you hike here, and you're just like, oh, I thought I was in pretty good shape. Seems like I am in such good shape as I thought. Well, your body has to get used to that change in altitude. So um, the respiratory system can respond to changes in oxygen, whether it's an external thing like hiking in a mile high city, or if it's something that's happening internally in your body or just a local environmental issue. So the way that it can adapt to these changes, it can increase the number of breaths or reduces the number of breaths per minute, um, and that's called a change in respiratory rate. And it can also change the volume of air moved per breath, and we call that our tidal volume. Gas exchange happens between the blood and the air, which we already know across the respiratory membrane. How this gas exchange happens or what this gas exchange is dependent upon are the partial pressures of that gas and also the diffusion of molecules between the liquids in the gas. So this is going to bring us to our second gas law. Our first gas law, Boyle's law, we talked about pulmonary ventilation, how pressure and volume were inversely related to one another. Now we're going to talk about a couple of different, we have two more gas laws that we're going to refer to now, and they are going to um, deal with gas exchange. So Dalton's Law is our next one. Um, Dalton's Law and partial pressures. First thing before we even discuss the law itself is to understand what is the real composition of air. So far, I've just very genetically been saying, you know, you breathe in oxygen, you exhale out carbon dioxide. But that's a little bit misleading because you don't just breathe in oxygen. There are lots of other gases that are part of the atmospheric gas of air that we breathe in. In fact, we have about 78% of our air is nitrogen and only about 20% of it's oxygen. We have water vapor and carbon dioxide that we're also breathing in. Very slow amounts, um, less than 1% for both of these here, but they're still constituents and part of the air itself. Now over here, what I have as far as the discussion of the bends, is an interesting discussion about nitrogen bubbles. Um, the bends is a condition that happens when you have um, nitrogen bubbles that will expand in your joints, and it causes very, very, very painful cramping. And the cramping is so painful that you are doubled over in pain or you are bent over. So I don't know for sure, but I feel like it was uh, – the Navy that may have coined this term the bins or maybe deep sea divers um, because they're usually the people that um, have the greatest chance of facing the bins itself. Um, what happens here is that nitrogen gas bubbles are very sensitive to pressure changes. So nitrogen gas bubbles, if there's a lot of pressure, let's say you're going deep sea diving, those Nitrogen gas bubbles will get really, really tiny. The pressure will cause them to get really, really, really small, and then they will diffuse because it is part of the gas that you're breathing in. They will diffuse into your joints. And if you rise up too rapidly, then when they start to, they'll expand too rapidly, and they'll expand within your joints, and you have this buildup of gases in your joints that causes you to be in just so much pain. Um, there is a scale that tells you about how quickly, depending on how long you spent at a certain depth, um, how long you should take to come up to make sure that you don't get the bends. And if you've ever taken a diving class, um, they usually are wicky well-versed in that, and this is something that they will discuss there. 
Um, it's also not recommended that you fly the same day that you dove and went deep sea diving um, uh, because that can also lead to the bins as well. So what Dalton's law really says is that each gas contributes to the total pressure in proportion to its relative abundance. So how much each gas contributes to this one atmospheric pressure or what we've been using, 760 millimeters of mercury, how much that um, gas is going to contribute to that overall 760 number depends upon the concentration of that gas, how much of the percentage of that gas is there. So, for example, we know that we have nitrogen, oxygen, water vapor, and carbon dioxide. Of all of these, it makes sense that carbon dioxide is going to exert the least amount of partial pressure because it's the least concentrated of all of them. Nitrogen gas is going to exert the highest amount of partial pressure because it's the most concentrated on here. So really when we talk about moving forward from here, we really have to start talking about the partial pressure of oxygen as opposed to just talking about the pressure of oxygen by itself. So Henry's Law is our third and final gas law that we are going to discuss today. Um, Henry's Law says that the volume of a gas that will dissolve into a solvent is proportional to the solubility of that gas and at that pressure. So when a gas under pressure, oh, let's just say the gas of oxygen in your lungs, if it comes into contact with liquid, oh, say you are developing pneumonia and you have excess fluid in your lungs, then that gas is going to dissolve into the liquid until equilibrium is released. We don't want oxygen to dissolve into a fluid in our lung. We want oxygen to go past the respiratory membrane and get into a red blood cell and take it to the tissues of our body. So that's why pneumonia is a problem. Having too much fluid in your lungs is an issue. Keep in mind that you're always going to have some low levels of fluid in there. Remember, it's like point. 0.5% or 0.5% of water vapor you inhale in with the composition of air, and then your cells are going to give you a byproduct of water left over. So there's going to be a little tiny bit of water in there, but not a whole lot. At a given temperature, the amount of gas in solution is proportional to the partial pressure of that gas. So at any temperature, and this changes for temperature, that's why we have to say at a given temperature, how much gas is in that solution is going to be dependent upon how much pressure is exerted by that particular gas. And then finally, the amount of, of uh, the actual amount of gas in solution at a given partial pressure and temperature depends on how soluble that gas is in that lipid. Some gases are more soluble and more efficiently than other gases will. So looking at a A little bit of a technical difficulty there, um, and we won't go too much further so we can wrap this session up. Um, she would put a um, my mother when we would grow up. I put a little tissue paper on the inside of her her pop can to keep it from from uh, going flat. So really, and her grandmother, my my grandmother, her mother um, had like a sixth grade education, so very, um, she was intuitively scientifically inclined, but she did not have a formal scientific education. And uh, she taught her that. She taught her children that if you don't want it to go flat, then you need to put something in there. And so she had an understanding of Henry's law um, about the solubility of gas in a, a liquid, um, even though it wasn't actually taught here just from experience. So solubility in body fluids. We're not talking about cans of Coke here. We're talking about um, the fluid that's in your body. Between those gases that we have that we're, we're mostly concerned about, carbon dioxide is a little less soluble. So um, the rate of oxygen solubility um, is just a little bit less than what we find for carbon dioxide. And then the very lowest is nitrogen. It has a very low solubility. So partial pressures in alveolar air and in capillaries, blood that comes in, blood arriving in pulmonary arteries has a low partial pressure of oxygen. It makes sense that blood coming in arteries that have left out of the right side of the heart because it's carrying deoxygenated blood would have a low partial pressure of oxygen. They drop off all their oxygen, so the partial pressure of oxygen is quite low. 
the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is going to be much higher. So that carbon dioxide that was picked up from those interstitial tissues and then carried by their red blood cells is going to be higher. That all sort of kind of makes sense for us right now. Of carbon dioxide will force the gas to go from an area of pressure to low pressure for both oxygen and for carbon dioxide. So as a result, oxygen entering into the blood went from a high concentration in your lungs to a low concentration in the red blood cells, and carbon dioxide is going to leave the blood and enter into the lungs to be exhaled out. This is a very quick, and because it is a rapid exchange, it allows the alveolar air to reach equilibrium, so you never really get a chance for either oxygen or carbon dioxide to diffuse into the, the small amount of water that may be in the lungs because uh, this quick rapid exchange. And then the volume of the, the fluid there is also very low. It's minuscule. It's on a molecular level, if you will. So here is a beautiful picture of all that happening where we have our alveolar sac that's full of oxygen, and then we have our capillary. This is the capillary that's coming from the venule end of it. Notice the partial pressure of oxygen is at 40 millimeters of mercury, partial pressure of carbon dioxide is at 45. Within the alveolar sac, we breathe in all this oxygen, partial pressure of oxygen is at 100. Um, because in the composition of air, there's a higher concentration of oxygen in the air than there is the carbon dioxide. So the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is much lower. Moving from an area of high pressure to low pressure, this concentration gradient drives oxygen into the circulatory system, and this carbon dioxide is going to be driven into the alveolar sac. Um, and as a result, you are exhaling out carbon dioxide and taking in um, oxygen, and then that happens for your lungs. So these are your pulmonary arteries, your pulmonary veins, and notice they're freshly oxygenated. And when we get down to the level of the tissue, we're carrying this freshly oxygenated blood. Notice that it's nice and red over here. 95 millimeters of mercury as opposed to 40 millimeters of mercury over here. So moving from an area of high concentration to where the oxygen is lower drives oxygen into their interstitial tissue. Lots of carbon dioxide made because it's a byproduct of cellular respiration. Um, and it drives it back into the um, capillary bed and takes it on its way to the lungs to be exhaled out. Notice that you're not going to have all of your oxygen diffuse across the plasma membrane and diffuse into the interstitial tissues. Remember we talked about the solubility of gases in body fluids, that carbon dioxide has a higher solubility of gases in body fluids than oxygen does. So not all of this oxygen is going to make its way into the body fluids, but enough of it will. So I think that's where we're going to end for today. Um, we will finish up on this discussion.